and then like after the fact like felt like he needed to come clean about something in his past that is essentially yes. got the job offer revoked right yes so i've been there and i tell you i think you got it all wrong i mean you basically advised that the guy you know there's times for integrity and there's times for not and i i do understand your point and i make that compromise many times you know i've certainly made that compromise in my life you know and it hasn't always like immediately backfired but i tell you i you know right before right before i started talking to you back in 2017 18 maybe yeah. the the two years preceding that that like if we go back two years before we started talking i basically like flamed out of the corporate world in a bad way, like in a way that like, if I, if I told an employer what happened, I wouldn't get another job. Okay. So basically because of Adderall abuse and, uh, I spent 10 months unemployed and I started, you know, like, uh, maybe eight months into that. The first, the first six months, there's no way I could get a job. Like my brain was fucked up. You know, I just couldn't, I just wasn't ready. You know what I mean? I was recovering. And, uh, and then I got a couple of job interviews with like jobs that like really fit my skills and were very interesting, but I can recall one job interview I had where we were talking and like sort of inevitably my gap in employment came up. Right. And I thought I had a story about like, you know, like what I could say that would sort of gloss over that and move on. And as I was talking I talked myself into, um, I talked myself into a corner where like really, I ended up like freezing up. It was a phone interview and just hanging up on the person and turning off my phone. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't, and it ended up like, I mean, I just broke down in tears. I mean, I was like, man, I'm so fucked. Like, I don't know what to say. I can't say it with, I can't lie that hard. You know what I mean? I'm just not capable of it. And and that was like really rough. And it was like, and so, you know, my 30th birthday was like a couple of weeks after that. And I remember like driving with my dad and sort of reflecting on the fact that I might have less money in my pocket at 30 than I did 20, <laughs> which was not good, man. Trust me. And I resolved that like, if I was going to get my shit back together, like, I, I was in such a bad spot that like, really I needed to rebuild from the ground up, meaning I needed somewhere to go at seven 30 in the morning, no matter what it paid, I needed to like get back on a routine, like get my shit back together. And so I called like my old boss that I worked construction in, in high school and he gave me a job for like $15 an hour. Okay. I mean, this goes from like making nearly six figures to like $15 an hour was was really bad, you know, but I was able to tell him exactly what was going on with me. Like, Hey man, I fucked up on drugs. I'm clean now, but like, and really all I need is like something to do. Like I will be helpful. You know, I just need a, I just need something to do, you know, now let's fast forward like seven years later, I'm making a ton of freaking money. And I work for my house. And I work with all men and I don't deal with DEI and I don't deal with bullshit, you know? And I, and like the relationship I have with my boss is like built on honesty, you know, but I had to take a major step back, man, because like, I tell you that like first or second day that I was on that job site and we, you know, I got sent down to Chipotle to get lunch for everybody. And I am down in Georgetown, like M street, like the power center of America. Okay. And I walk into the Chipotle and everybody's in their suits, you know, and I'm standing there covered in dust. And it's like, you all think I'm just some redneck or something. And it's like, I'm as educated, if not more educated than most of you. And I was, I used to dress like you when I went to Chipotle, you know, and look how low I am, you know, and but I'm so much happier. My marriage is so much better, man. Like it took time, you know, but like, there's no way that I would get to where I'm at today 
if I had to like sort of like continue in the lie, you know, like if my new job was built on this, like, you know, and the anxiety of knowing that if they ever found out, like, I mean, that thought in the back of your head, like that shit eats at you, man. Like that's how you end up relapsing, right? <laughs> because you're not clean. You're not living clean. So I thought I would share that, that I think that like, I do understand that sometimes like we, we find ways to rationalize, like compromising uh, the truth for like expediency and practical concerns. But, you know, in the long run, I think it's a lot better to like be honest. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, employers are not going to be fully honest with you either, just as a perspective, you know, job applicant. So you're dealing with a situation where both parties usually are representing things that are not 100% accurate. I completely agree with you, but that's sort of their prerogative because they have the money and the power, you know, and you sort of have to like do what you got to do, you know, as the, as a young man for in particular. Um, So, and I, I don't think they owe every detail, but I, I just can assure you that, you know, and I remember like my wife was like very upset when she found out like I was like at the construction site instead of like in another job. But as I, and like now, and, and it took time, but now I just, I don't think I could actually like sort of the work-life balance slash income slash lifestyle situation that we've come to would not have worked out like the route that she wanted me to go, you know? So anyway. I, I think there's also a significant difference here between uh, honesty and full disclosure. So I, I believe that you should present yourself at a job interview in an honest way. I don't believe that you should necessarily employ full disclosure in a job interview. So, well, so here, I agree with you. But how do you like, okay, practically speaking, how do you honestly, without fully, like, why haven't you worked for 10 months? Like, what's the answer? Well, because I'm a fucking drug addict. You know, like, I have really bad self control problems, or I got fired twice within six months because, like, I couldn't get out of bed before 10 30 in the morning, you know, and I was flaky as fuck. Like, but trust me, that's not me anymore. Or, like, why aren't you working? I, you know, what do you say without lying? What do you say? Okay, so uh, what do you say depends on, on the context. Are you now, in, in the situation that you described, are you now capable of getting up and showing up to a regular job? If you're not, that's one thing. But if you are capable, if you have recovered from that addiction, then I, I don't see it as necessary to disclose in the job applicant process that you that you uh yes. you know got fired then then i would start looking for a story where you, you can find a grain of truth in it so that you can say it with sincerity so if you're a new father then you know i just wanted my my wife works and so it's up to me to take care of the kid or uh we we're building a home or remodeling a home and i just love remodeling i'm working with my father uh remodeling my home i I can financially afford to take 10 months off work and just work with my father or work with my friend, or I've always wanted to do uh, consulting or, I mean, there's something that you can find a grain of truth to if you needed to. Look, I, I do hear you and that this was basically like the route that I was trying to go. But the problem was, was like, I just. You couldn't do it. I couldn't because do it because like when I would say it, like I couldn't, even, I, I couldn't, mm -hmm. I could just, the feeling I had inside of me, like when I said that thing, like this is when I talked myself into the corner. Mm -hmm. I just reached this point in the conversation where like, I just couldn't go forward. Like I just couldn't do it. And I couldn't, um, because I also didn't believe, here's the thing. I realized like, I wasn't actually the guy yet who was up in the morning. Like, yeah. I needed to like recover from like crashing off and, and adjust getting my brain sort of back to quote normal or something more normal after what I was doing. 
but like there's no evidence that like i know how to get up in the morning because i haven't been doing it you know like i needed to go to the seven o'clock job and honestly like there were fits and starts like i wasn't an ideal employee at first it wasn't like oh i just walk in and i'm like the best version of myself it's been years living like you know you know being irresponsible let's just put it that way and and it's taken time to get my shit together you know and I, uh yeah I mean, this is, yeah, very individual. So in your circumstance, it sounds like what you did was, was the best thing for you. In the circumstance that I was describing, this was someone with a professional license. So I believe a, a license. Dude, therapist. I was a CPA. I'm a CPA. Okay. Like, I had a license too. Like, and, and I did forego, like, a golden path. Okay. I walked yeah, but, off the golden path. But did your, but, did your disclosure cost you your CPA license? Because in the story I told... By being fully disclosive, they lost their license. I have abandoned my license because I have no intention of ever being a CPA. I dropped my CPE. Like, I stopped doing CPE. Like, I let it go. So, I let it go because I never wanted to work like that again. Like, the feeling of sitting in the cubicle, the corporate shit, the, like, the, you know, the women, the women at the company meeting or the diverse meeting with no, you know, everybody's reaching their hands in the middle and there's not a single white hand. Okay. Like, um, I, I think now, like, where would I be? Like, what, what would it take me to like continue to be successful in that setting? Just eating so much shit. Dude, the money I'm making now, like where, like circumstances that have happened around me and like opportunities I've gotten, um, you know, like when we started talking in 2018, at that point, I was probably making uh, with overtime, like 50 G's. Okay. Not much. We're like quadruple that now. And like with like a lot more, like I, you know, I'm in charge of shit now. So like I, I just look at it as like, yeah, I took a massive step back, and in the light, it was not clear how it was going to go for years, and my wife was not happy. You know what I mean? You know, women will constantly dissuade you from doing anything that's not like the most safest, like immediately visible in front of their face choice. Um, right. So th there are just so many factors here. See, you talk about integrity, but there's also the integrity of responsibility for for your family. So you your family i assume was able to swing your dramatic decrease yeah that's true it's to true do, it's true. to do your yeah. you got to indulge your integrity and your family, <laughs> your family was able to survive it because your wife subsidized your integrity sure uh, other people in a similar situation would not be in a position where their wife could subsidize their integrity so you have to take the consequences of what you're saying and doing uh, in your family, to your family into consideration. So people in a different situation where someone else is not going to subsidize them being so filled with integrity yeah, yeah. may have to think of a, a different choice. Integrity is not just about something you say between you and a potential employer. It's also about how will this affect my family? How will this affect my children? How will this affect people who are counting on me to earn? Yeah, and what I would say is like I totally, um, I, I can... There, there's no question um, that she was not like some um, she was not like some stay-at-home mom with no marketable skills. You know what I mean? She was able to produce income, um, and she's still, I mean, a very successful person. Okay, there's no doubt about it. But I, I would just say that I would just say that like the honest approach in my has it's it's. It's usually and it's usually painful. Like it's it's like it the pain is is immediate, and the benefits are uncertain and they come later. And I've seen it like in this and in other aspects of my life. Like even my relationship with my wife. Like instead of like maybe you know avoiding certain subjects to quote make peace. Um, like when things that are underneath the surface are like really addressed like it's a really painful process and then there's a really like there's like the risk that i don't know maybe you break the relationship up or something 
but what's built after that, like if you can get through it, like it's just so much better. And I guess what I'd say is I, over the course of the last seven years, I have become, I, I've just like, I'm, 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 I've been more honest than I, than maybe like the prior seven and my life is going in a better direction. Yeah, I mean, honesty is a good thing, but what you're also really talking, I think, more accurately is being more disclosive. You know, you can be honest without disclosing a whole bunch of challenging or damaging information. And you're siding with, you're disclosing more. Well, because there is lying by omission. Sometimes, like, keeping your mouth shut, like, I mean, dude, I mean, think about, like, the inner, I mean, relationships you've had where, you've swallowed you swallowed shit or kept your mouth shut because maybe you thought somebody would like take you, you know, it would like lead to a conflict that you didn't really want because you cared about the person or something. And then, and then like at the end of the day, maybe like you do, it finally like boils out, right? Like it pops out, like how you really feel and their reaction is not nearly as bad as you thought it was, you know, or or like if you had maybe said it sooner, you could save yourself some real heartache. Like I said, it's like a feeling in the back of your head, that anxiety that like the things that aren't being taken care, care of that like cause people to escape into addiction. Like I can think of, you know, time, you know, when I struggle with porn, there's times like there's something at work that I need to do or something like some bill I need to pay or like some doctor's appointment i need to make that i keep putting off and it's like it to like shut that voice up or like consume the thing that like it you know the the addicted the addiction whatever it is you know and so i feel like if i had gone into that career and not like based off the even if with a grain of truth in it like it would always be back in the back of my mind and like that kind of living that way is like what makes you fall off the wagon you know, it's interesting because, I mean, you're all about 12 steps and stuff. It's like, I mean, they they are all about, like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think that's over the top. Like, let me go. I'm going to go call my girlfriend from high school and be like, hey, just so you know, I cheated on you at a party one time or something. Like, because I need to make amends because I was a drinker. Like, I don't know. That's kind of. Well, the anecdote I was, I was giving you was from a 12-step context. But w- the, the amount you disclose it's usually something you talk about with people with more recovery than yourself because it's not automatically it's not automatically the right thing for you to disclose everything to everyone for example it can cause a lot of you know needless pain and, and disruption to your life and to other people to disclose certain things that you like let's say you killed someone um you know i don't think people in your life would be better off learning about that yeah but, or if you were cheating, like you, you cheated on a bunch of ex-girlfriends. I don't think you should call them up and apologize for, for cheating on them. You would just, you would get, you would get direction from pretty much any sponsor, anyone with recovery to not call up people and cause them needless harm. And, and you, you matter too. So a, a lot of people, they get recovery or they, they find, they seize on some virtue such as integrity. And then yeah. they just want to go 100% full bore without respect to how it's going to affect them and other people and having integrity and decency, meaning you have to take yourself and other people into account. That's part of integrity. So telling your spouse that you've had sex with a best friend, which she did not know about, that may not necessarily be in everyone's best interests. So people often just want to start disclosing everything, but that sometimes is not the, the best thing to do for other people and for yourself. You can you can needlessly destroy people with needless disclosure. There there has sure. to be some consideration for for other people and for yourself. It's not. So, it's like the Constitution is not a death warrant. Honesty and disclosure yeah. is not a death warrant either. Like you, you sure, make amends and- to drug dealers, for example. I'll just finish this point. You, yeah. you in in twelve steps, you often people will need to make amends to a drug dealer, but you don't go meet them alone in a dark alley. You take big people from the program with you. You know, you meet them at a Starbucks and you repay them the money that you owe them. Pass. Yeah, so the convert 
I, I feel like there's like something in that that's like it, it's the red pill, it's the convert the con the converts behavioral pattern. I mean, you were a convert. I would mm-hmm. say you probably would you not say that in those first however many years you were like you were clinging to certain even if the principle is Judaism or like some aspects of it that you found so transformative in your own life and you want to proselytize that to others, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. because it's like, Oh my gosh, like my eyes are open. I see now. Right. Yes. And like, I want you to be able to see cause I care about you, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think that that's like, that's human nature. Like I, I think that, yeah, I mean, It's interesting, like, is in some ways, like, how that's repulsive to everybody around you is kind of, like, part of the consequence of your lifestyle before that conversion or part of, like, I, I don't know, man. It, it's, like, I can see how that looks foolish to the rest, you know, to the rest of us who are, like, a cradle Catholic, like, some convert is, like, a fucking weirdo. You know what I mean? Because they're almost, like, more fundamental than the person that lives it. But, of course, like, all of us are just so damn complacent in our own lives. Like and people also, fr- I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. You know, it, just to bring back to like your subject of the day, I was listening to you talk about the guy um, or how, how Christian nationalists like tend not to go to church, you know, and how it's almost kind of like, they get like politicized, like you leave church and you get politicized because church is really not that political of a place, you know? Um, I mean, the rainbow churches are, but they're not really churches, but, but like, um, and so, and they certainly aren't like, uh, like party politic, at least like the white churches I've been to, I'm, maybe black churches are different, but um, I feel like, when you leave the church, you're sort of like, you're, you're Christian, like, uh, it's like that energy that you mentioned, like, typically goes into charity, right? Or, like, your community gets, like, harnessed by politics, right? You become politicized. Yes. In the yes. same way that, like, secular Jews, like, are, politi- are, are political, Right. I yeah. would say more so than the religious ones. Yeah. Like the Haredi, I mean, they have like the local thing, like they want to dominate and get their welfare and stuff like that. But I, I would imagine they're not like as caught up in like Donald Trump versus Joe Biden in the way that like the secular ones are, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's a void when people leave religion that often gets filled by politics. Yeah, so it's like Christian, the rise of Christian national, you know, because, you know, gosh, as much as like, in some ways, it, it really defines my mindset, I do find myself like, going, I mean, is this really true? Like, the, you know, the idea that like, we're going to find Christ through like politics is a joke. It's a joke. You know, it's not going to make the world a better place. You know what I mean? I don't know, like. It's just a twisting of it, you know, and it's and it's like easily captured by other people. Like, you know, the government has really, and I think we see this with like the ADL thing. Like, who does the ADL speak for, and who's going to bear the consequences of the ADL's actions, right? Like ADL, you know, not it's it's like I'm sure that like in Germany at one point there was like certain people speaking for Jews that basically did not help Jews stay out of concentration camps. And they themselves were not the ones that went. And like, you know, ADLs just, you know, it's big Jew versus little Jew. You've made this point many times. And I think like, you know, big Christ versus little Christ. I don't think big Christ has anything to do with politics. And actually I become like really, I mean, it's been in, on my mind for years, but I really do think like Donald Trump and Elon Musk and Marjorie Taylor Greene, like if anybody's the antichrist, it's like these characters who like, it's not going to be the people like explicitly attacking Christians that are actually the antichrist. 
It'll be the people manipulating and like cloaking themselves in it. Well, I mean, you're, you're hitting on many themes there, but one is disillusionment. And I think we, we get disillusioned when we put more into something than it can handle. So if we think that uh, moving American politics in a more Christian nationalist direction is going to be some kind of messianic change for life in, in America, no, it's not. It might incrementally make certain things better. And it might have some negative effects as well, but it's not going to be the, the ultimate salvation. So people, I think, get disillusioned with politics because they put you know, an exaggerated amount of emphasis on politics. If they, if they had a more sober perspective uh, on politics, they, they'd recognize the limitations of the political. Yeah, and there's also this like sort of... From a- sort of this like old testament mindset like that you know is cited and it's definitely part of the bible but you know i don't think that vengeful like go about like destroy your enemies i mean that's not christ's message it's just really not you know and i think that like when you go down that road you end up destroying yourself so and I think that's what colonial, you know, colonial. I saw this like really interesting tweet today where the guy, it was basically saying like, someone said like, oh, Israel is like the last bastion of European like colonial spirit, right? And someone commented like, no, like European colonization was like this like post Reformation like Judaizing of the West. So, like, our colonialism was actually this, like, Jewish energy. Or I say, listen, I mean, to me, it's like Old Testament energy, like going into the promised land, taking it for yourself, destroying your enemies. It's actually, like, been the downfall of Europeans. I mean, seriously, like, the the moral frame is such that because of colonialism, now all of our countries are, have, I mean, the demographic replacement has happened. Like, it's over. Like, we got colonized. Like, we destroyed ourselves. For what? For, like, spices? Holy shit. Did you, see, did you see the movie Saving Private Ryan? Yeah, many times. Okay, remember the scene where the German soldier pleads for his life and they let him, yeah. let him go free? And then he comes back and kills one of them. So th- there's a time and a place to kill your enemy and not let him go free. And there's a time and a place not to. And you don't want to be wrong. Yeah, but I mean that's also like propaganda, right? Like that. No, that's because, also like, real you life. You make that choice. You can make. Uh, you can make. I could. I could write that story many ways, right? Like. No, but it reflects things that go on in real life. Sometimes letting your enemy goes free, go free. You know, cost you your life. Yeah, but there's like many times in history where like magnet, like the guy's only a, you know he hangs on, he has like effective rulership because he is like magnanimous yes what you like that's how you unite afterwards like it's complicated it depends on the situation yeah it's a situation whether that whether you know i could write that story where like the guy's in a tight spot later and the german guys got him by the balls but because you let him go he let you go you know what i mean like i could write that too and that would also be real life like the represent you know, reciprocity across, like, the, you know, inhumanity of this battlefield. Um, that is also true. So, I, it's interesting, though, because, like, I think that, I think that, um, I think there's a difference in the Jewish and Christian worldview when it comes to, to like, that specific thing. Like, what do you do with your enemy? Like, what do you do yeah. with those who have wronged you? Like, where does, where's the role of vengeance? And, you know, I don't know if we are, I think I mentioned this at the time, but like, what did Kanye say about, um, about Christians getting sucked into like Jewish vengeance against Germans, like against Hitler? Like, that's not our religion to like hold, to be like, you know, this forever blood debt against uh, uh, Hitler and the Germans. I think Jews do have that. Like Hitler yes. is the eternal enemy. Yes. 
I mean, like, Amalek, he must Amalek, be destroyed. Yeah, Amalek is the eternal enemy. I mean, that's for 3,000 years. Uh, the Torah commands that you shall blot out Amalek. Never forget what Amalek did to you. So Hitler's just a continuation of the various Amalekites in Jewish history. Right, and that they just have to be destroyed. And like, yes, you know, so which is like genocide or whatever word you want to put on it. But like, that is not Christ's message. <laughs> and I think that's like very clear. So um, I think that. The great thing about the Luke Ford show is it helped. I, I think it's like helped educate a lot of people about the differences between Jews and Christians, and people can do with that what they want. But I think it's important that everybody not be ignorant <laughs> about those differences. Now, I'm curious back to your 2017 situation. Did you have people in your life that you could talk this over with, or did you make all these decisions on your own pretty much? You mean like when to go, like what job yeah. to get? Yeah, how to approach a job interview, what, what job to take, because I'd like to think there's one thing that we could agree on, that anyone finds themselves in a situation like what you described, that they have people in their life that they can talk to about because the individual alone does not make good decisions when compared to having people that he can talk things over with. I would think that nobody, no one, see, no one really understood like, how I felt inside my own head about like, you know, what does it mean to be addicted to this drug? Like, why is it like that you feel like, you know, what does it mean to be four or five, six months of like, not like not be able to like plan to be on an hour. You know what I mean? Like that all you're capable of doing is like sort of what's right in front of you. Um, and um so no one really understood that i felt like i was gonna fail and you know what honestly let's dude you know what i i've totally forgotten about this but like there's another like very clear parallel like if i go back another um let's see 20 2000 if i go back another like eight nine years before this when i got kicked out of college my first semester for or like halfway through my second semester, I got kicked out because I was like, got caught with like weed in my dorm. Okay. Um, and so I got suspended for a semester. So I couldn't come back for like a year. And in the meantime, like, you know, I had to show that I was like working on my problems. So I was going to this like group class for um, addiction. And it was like mostly DUI people who were like being put through the thing. And of course, like there's some random Spanish guy in there that gives me like an ounce of weed for no reason. I don't even know what the deal was like from the class. Like I was still smoking weed. Okay. And it came time. And like, I worked that year working for the construction company I work for now. Like I come back making $9 an hour and like had paid my dad back the $10,000 for the semester. So he would send me to school again. I got all my paperwork. They accepted me back. And I decided, I said, Dad, I can't go back. I was like, I know that if I go back there, I'm going to get kicked out again. Or I'm going to get, like, D's. Like, I'm just, I can't do it. So I went to community college. And, and like, after a little bit of, you know, it took me about a year to, like, get it together. Basically, my dad cut, cut me off, and I had to start paying for college myself. I got straight A's the rest of the way, man. I graduated with honors. Uh, from a good business school, I got a great job. But, like, if I had gone back there, it, because everybody thought I should go back, like, why would you not go back? Like, you can go back to college. Like, they'll let you back in. It's like, no, I can't do it because I'm not, you know, I'm not, re I'm not, I'm not able, you know. And, like, it's led me to where I am now, man. I got a good life. You know, I got a lot of cousins. Uh, I got a lot of cousins. I'm definitely the most well-off between me and my wife and I got great kids and I've done a lot of fucked up shit, but I feel like, you know, I, I fall off, you know, I don't know. I right. So when I talked about it, it would have been good if you had people in your situation had people to talk with. I mean, people who have experience with Adderall addiction. So people who don't have experience with Adderall addiction aren't going to be much help to you. 
It's true. It's true. I, yeah. I mean, it kind of happened after the fact, but I, like, sort of after I started working and, um, you know, after I left accounting and decided to go work at the construction company, was that I had a cousin who, like, dealt with addiction, like a second cousin, or my dad's cousin, like an older, older generation. And she told me, and this is, like, the thing I've, like, hung on to and, like, uh, passed on to other people who have, I know, have dealt with this, is that you can't be 110% of yourself. Like, you know, this Adderall makes you feel like you can be 110% of yourself. But, like, that's not, that doesn't last. That, like, all you can be is 100% of yourself. Like, and being okay with that, like, being okay with, like, that you can't get it done, you know? And it applies to so many areas of life. Like, all the hobbies you wish you had, the skills you wish you had, the work that you wish, you know, you, you had gotten done or you could do more, um, you could be better, you could be stronger or whatever, you could be healthier. And it's like, you know, you just, you gotta be, you gotta be comfortable with yourself, you know? And, and that's like, it's, it's helped me stay clean. Cause it's like, yeah, there's times like I deal with like certain deadlines at work, certain pressures where, you know, I really wish I could get my hands on some of that stuff to like push through it. But, but then I go, you know what? If I, like, I just can't. And I, I, I just, I need to deal with the consequences of that or, or approach work, or approach these situations differently in the future so that I don't get put into corners where like I need to boost myself up. Like that, you know? And, um, but like I said, man, most people don't, most people will say, I think, what you say, which is like, you know, do what you need to do to get ahead and like. No, no, no. I didn't say. It's really like a suggestion. No, no. I didn't say do what you need to do to stay ahead. said that if you want to talk about integrity, like consider the consequences for the people around you, such as your family, as well as yourself. And that doesn't mean that you need to operate with full disclosure. I never said do what you need to do. But you should be talking to other people who are in a similar situation as well, you have. How did you? How are you not saying? Home. Yeah, but how are you not saying that? I mean, you are saying like the basically the truth is when it's inconvenient that it can go out the window. At times, there are higher values than the truth, and, and you believe that too. You you don't disclose one hundred percent of everything to everyone you encounter. Truth is one of a, of many values. If yeah, but got... truth isn't like my. But but see, truth is not like my opinion of the hat you're wearing, right? Like I think your hat is stupid. It crosses my mind. I don't share it. But like that's not the truth, right? But like, you didn't ask me what I think of your hat. You know what I mean? No, no. I'm talking <laughs> about the most embarrassing you know, like... things that we've ever done. You don't owe that to everyone you meet to list off to them the most embarrassing things you've ever done. Sure. Sure, but like I think like if if someone asks you, uh, and you don't always you don't owe is, everyone one hundred percent disclosure. That, like well, I, 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 I haven't agree. told you. I, I agree with you yeah. that I that people can't like if they can't like see it like if it's not like relevant or it doesn't come up like you you don't owe like let me reveal to you things that you never would have known if I didn't choose to tell you right now. Now like you know under the cloak of anonymity in this conversation on youtube and like the the history of the conversations that we've had together like i don't it doesn't and i probably have shared like but all of that in like different stories before anyway i don't you know i feel comfortable to share that in this context in the context of an employer yeah i'm not telling you about what happened in college but like if you're asking me about like why i haven't worked in the last 10 months i just for what it whether it's my conscience or something I just couldn't, like, I couldn't do it without, like, feeling, like, you feel, you know, the feeling of feeling transparent, like, people can see through your life. Yes. And then, like, that feeling is, like, projects out, and that's when they know they can't trust you. Like, they people see it. People see that reaction. And, like, the, the pathological liar can, like, shield that, and I don't have that. So no, I'll, I'll give you another example. I'm very public, you know, sex and love addict, uh, you know, being in, in recovery sobriety for about uh, 11 years. 
uh, if I share that with someone in the workplace, there, there are a lot of people who will use that against me. Sure. Agree. I agree with you. I think that, like, did they ask you about if you beat off last night? You know what I'm saying? Like, your relationship with beating off? No, so you don't bring it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, like, if you were getting in a relationship with a woman. Oh, yeah. But if I was uh, if the first, basically, first date. Like, in that well, context, in yeah. that context. Yes. That you would, disclose. You would. Yes. So what I'm saying is, like, in an Yes, <laughs> my employment history is relevant to my employer, right? It's not full disclosure to, or it's not over disclosure to need to reckon with the truth of, of that situation. Like, you know, my CV has a blemish, you know, and, and I can lie about it and hope no one ever finds out and like basically like carry that around with me, you know, that, that guilt and that, because it's a, it's a moving forward situation. Like my fidelity to my high school girlfriend or something is irrelevant to the future. Therefore it doesn't need to be like, go back and address. Now, if I was like trying to become a recovering alcoholic and I was like actively having an affair with my wife's best friend, like actively or something like that. I mean, you got to deal with that or you're never going to get clean. Now, you cheated on your wife with your best friend 20 years ago, like you kissed at a party one time, and that woman's like dead or something. And I, you know, disclosure in that case, like how does that help you move forward? I, I don't, you know, maybe I, I can see less of a case, but you can't live, you can't continue to like live in your sin. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. You can't stay there. So I I feel like. I feel like in this context of like how, you know, what do you owe your employer? I think like I did things in my career that shut me out from that path. Like I fucked it up and I can like hope a lie will be enough of a band aid to like keep it alive, but it would not be like a healthy, strong foundation for advancing through that career. And the one that I have now, while it's a different career path and has like different pros and cons. Um, I it is on a solid foundation. Nobody cares about things that happened when I was an accountant. You know what I mean? No one cares. It doesn't come up. It's not relevant. So I don't tell anybody. I mean, other than my boss, who's a family friend. But anyway, how many bosses who are alcoholics do you think disclose that to prospective job applicants? Virtually none. Bosses sure. don't disclose their own addictions to potential job applicants. But they're bosses. Like, bosses and employees are not equal. You no, know, but in many why, why do you owe more to a potential employer than a potential employer owes you? I, I, don't, see, I don't see potential employers telling potential employees about their own addiction history. You know, I feel like it's like the relationship between father and son, like the father has his sins, right? Like every father is not perfect, right? But he, the son, you hold the son to standards, it's standards of behavior that we might falter to like hold ourselves to. And the son can like fixate on the hypocrisy of his father or understand that like just because his father's not living up to these ideals don't mean the ideals aren't good in and of themselves like you should be honest like just because your employer's not doesn't mean you shouldn't be because it's about your like your the health of your mind and soul and career and things and like <clears throat> just because your dad falls short or your boss falls short doesn't like excuse you well, I mean, it, it virtually never happens that a potential employer discloses to a job applicant the, uh, the employer's history with, with addiction. It, it virtually never happens. So I, I would see in this context of, of applying for a job, just as the boss and his supervisors are not going to disclose to a job applicant their own histories of addiction, why would the job applicant feel a necessity to disclose that to potential employers, and unless there's no way of going forward w without it. So I would assume that a potential employee could <coughs> perhaps talk about a depression or talk about 
there are all sorts of reasons I just don't see necessarily. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I guess what I'd say is, like, I was not so far gone that, like, I couldn't, like, the guilt just got to me, man. I don't know. And, and it also... It overcame me. Uh, and bosses... so, like, what do you do with that? Like, is that good? Is that bad? Like, do I need to... Is that path pathological... Uh... You know, I don't think you can pathologize that, man. Like, okay, so I couldn't, like, compartmentalize the lie. You know... Right, that's like I couldn't compartmentalize it. That guy that you that that felt like he couldn't deal with it, man. He couldn't he couldn't deal with it. And like, you know what? The alternate to say like, oh, he should have done X, Y, and Z. Like, that's not what he could have done because he couldn't have been. Think about like how if it was eating him. Think about it, man. Like he ate him up so much that he had to say that. Like, how could he keep that inside? He couldn't do it. If you felt that way about something. It would eat you up. And how often have you been betrayed by women who said, oh, you know, I, I recognize that I committed to uh, X, Y, Z, but now I feel strongly in a certain way, so I, I need to go do what I need to do, <laughs> you know, completely violating every understanding that you've, you've had together. No, they haven't People... actually. <laughs> I've more, I, that really hasn't happened to me, to be honest. Um a couple of times it hurts, but I, did, I always said like I did that way more than they did. So um, it's just, I guess like the the times that like, okay, like I can think of one girl, one girl in college that like I that like kind of well, let's just say I liked her more than she liked me. You know what I mean? Or we were kind of yes. in a relationship, but I I was. Uh, or, you know, I she was still looking for her husband. You know what I'm saying? Like, and uh, she eventually found him, like, one day. Like, she went home for Christmas break, and she ended up marrying that guy. And it's like, you know, I guess, like, I look at it as, like, I, had, I too, have done that to women. And that's also natural. And, like, you know, I just. Uh... Here's, a, here's another thing, the way I'm thinking about this. I think one measure of maturity is how much stress you can handle without lashing out at yourself and others so some of what you're talking about i think is absolutely the path of integrity i think a lot of what you're talking about as well is simply people who have not developed the maturity to deal with stress without lashing out at themselves or others such as by full disclosure so i think some situations you're just talking about people who can't deal with the anxiety and so they want to disclose 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 even if it wrecks themselves and other people and what what really needs to happen is the person needs needs a path to reduce their anxiety so that they can make better decisions and so just because one overwhelmingly wants to get rid of an anxiety uh doesn't necessarily mean that you should do the first thing that pops into your head but I, I wonder if it's like it's sort of this like conversion period where like you basically have so much built up that you do need to like sort of clean house before you can like Yeah, that's why you should clean. clean house to a sponsor or to someone with more experience in a particular area. You should be absolutely fully disclosive to somebody or to a community of people and you should not necessarily take it on your own shoulders to unilaterally make decisions on these you know, nuclear issues. You, you should absolutely get clean with certain people, you know. Who, yeah, that's who... great. It, no, that's, I think that that is like, I think that's right. So, so who did I have in that circumstance? It felt like nobody, because like I said, like, no one could really relate. Um, and like, I've had experience, I mean, I guess, like, I ended up, I started going to this thing called, um, which is called, Celebrate Recovery. It's mm -hmm. like a network. They, they're in, I'm sure, have you heard of it? I'm not sure. Okay, well, it's like a network, you know, they they basically might be like Thursday nights hosted at a bunch of, I've seen them at like evangelical churches. Like Thursday nights, like an AA meeting. We go, there's like a little worship service for like 15 minutes and then we go, we talk for an hour like about shit we're dealing with. Like go around the circle, like what's going on, you know. And you know, 
I did it. I did it because my mom begged me to do it. And how much did it help? It's really kind of unclear. I mean, I think it did help. I I couldn't put my finger on it, you know. Um, and in some ways, like the boss that I have now, like it was a figure who, like when I came to him for a job, it was not like, here, give me, I need a career. It was like, dude, I just need something for like a few weeks to like get me on a schedule. Like I would honestly do it for free. He, you know, offered me, you know, basically a token amount of money. Right. And, um, and then it just like, I was just useful. You know what I mean? It just kind of like inertia, like it just kind of took off, you know, and we had that relationship. But, you know, I don't think that I would ever. <clears throat> what would I do if I had like inevitably to find a job, like had to go out outside of the the, the network of family or family like connections? I think well, I would have I... eventually like had to lie, man. You know what I mean? Or I couldn't have done it the way I did it because no employer would take you. If you disclosed that you had like a drug problem. Like, it just, so there's just too many alternatives. applicants for jobs. <laughs> yeah, alternatives to what you did is to have a therapist or to be in a 12-step a program or a men's group. And it would have been most helpful if you had people who had the very thing that you were struggling with, such as Adderall addiction. So there are a ton of, I'm sure, 12-step uh, people and 12-step programs that, you know, deal with Adderall addiction. And so you can talk to people who've recovered from an Adderall addiction and you can be fully disclosive to them and within that circle and then get experience, strength and hope from them on, you know, building your life back up. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah, man. And it's something I would just say to like anybody who might ever listen to this is like, even when things seem like really dark, like they really do turn around. And, and time flies and where you think like your life is ruined like it's really not and uh and and it doesn't happen overnight and it's not perfect but like don't give up because i had dude i have a neighbor who earlier this week i mean she's four, like give or take a year on like late 30s okay eight year old and 11 year old they went to school they came home she was not alive anymore Wow. And it's just like, this is a woman that like I've talked to many times over the years, like for, during COVID, like hours, like watching the kids, got to know her and had no idea, you know? And so anyway. Yeah. Right, I, well, mean, I, have it, it helps I gotta know. get some stuff okay. done. Yep, well, here, say what you're going to say. Say what you're I was say. just going to say, yeah, it's like the Billy Joel song, you're only human, but it really helps. What's even better than believing that it gets better is to see concrete examples of people all around you in your social circle, uh, in your recovery circle, whose lives have gotten better and they have recovered from the very thing that has befell you. So is that why you hang around, stay around these circles? Because, I mean, I guess like new guys yeah. do need you. Yeah, yeah. I And I feel I get strong from feeling you know, helpful to other people who have similar problems that I've struggled with. So it's a, a mutually reinforcing thing. They get help from me and I get help from helping them. So by my desire to be helpful to them, that helps keep me on the right track. Yeah. Okay, bro. Thanks. All right, man. It was great Take talking care, to you. Take care, bro. Bye-bye. Okay, play a little bit more here from Ibrahim X. Kendi. Yeah, look, I'm probably putting words in Kendi's mouth here, but I think from his point of view, the things that we were mentioning, history and culture and geography or whatever, they're all still unfair. You know, like, and I'm going to stick with the Australian example to keep it out of the American context, but I think he would say, look, yes, you can give me lots of explanations for why a kid growing up in the country here is going to get is going to have a bad education and not earn very much money and just be essentially marginalized in various ways. And you can say it's, it's all complicated due to history and, and so on. But ultimately, um, if, if that person had been born in uh, metropolitan Melbourne, they'd be doing a lot better, statistically speaking, and that's unfair. So 